All right, so a couple things today. We're going to talk more about objects and classes. We got through like the first couple bit here, right? Maybe the first five sections or so. Oh, I gotta go turn these labs on for you too. Here you go. These are all fun labs. So we're gonna get into most of what happens here. We're not gonna do all of it necessarily uh, because again, this topic you'll hit a lot deeper, a lot more in depth next semester. I think registration was today for freshmen. Did someone tell me? Tomorrow. Opens tomorrow. <laughs> okay. I mean, we, we talk about it a lot early, 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 and then you just have to wait. Uh, but coming up soon, registration. <clears throat> so a couple other pieces to classes, right? This idea of object-oriented programming. It is a lot of fun because it's a more natural way for us to talk about things and interactions. It's very different from everything we've done so far, though, because things don't just happen line by line by line anymore. We don't just have loops now. We don't just have functions now. Now we're conceptually designing software. That's where stuff gets really interesting because you can design software in a gazillion different ways and it'll all do the same thing. So like objectively, if it gets the job done, that's good, right? But a little bit more subjectively, what makes it easy for us to understand and talk about and maintain and modify and tweak and work on? Right? And generally, that's going to be classes for us because classes allow us to take all of these details about something and encapsulate them. Right? We, we take a nice, neat little package, put it into one little detail here. So here's my class that represents student, right? And I'll have all the information. I'll know what your major is. I'll know what classes you've taken. I'll know what your GPA is. I'll know this sort of thing. I, I can take all those details about student and put them in one class. And then I can add public functions for things that students should do, like register for class or drop class or you know register for seminar or you know sign up for tutoring or do these sorts of whatever it happens to be. We can add public functions. Those are the things our objects do. Right. So when we're thinking about how we design classes, most of the time our nouns can turn into classes. Not all the time, but most of the time nouns are pretty good classes. And then the verbs, the things that they do, tend to be the functions. Right? These set and get or mutator and accessor methods, functions, they just let us set and get values. Those are good, and that's, that's the way we want people to access our attributes because we want to maintain the integrity of our class. Right? So if we had a student class, you probably don't want a way to just set a GPA. That doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? Your GPA is a calculated number based on the classes you've taken and the grade you've earned in those classes. So it wouldn't make sense to have a GPA attribute with a set function for it because you can't just change your GPA, right? You can take classes and get points for those classes and it calculates your GPA. So those sorts of things. So as we design our classes and look at those details, we write the functions that make sense for it. So you might have a function for get GPA, but the only way that it's ever going to change, right, is by saying, hey, this was the grade you got on a particular class. This is how many credits it was worth. This is the grade you got, right? We add up all those grade points together, divide by your total points, total number of credits. That's your GPA, your grade point average, right? Okay, cool. So that's one of the things we do with classes, right? And the way we start thinking about them and designing them. And we ran into some trouble here, not too much trouble, um, but it's a little bit wordy to have to call all these set functions when we start building out a class and saying, okay, now let's set this and 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 then we'll set this. It, it's a little bit slow, right? To have to call a bunch of set functions. So we looked at, hey, could we make a ticket class, right? And then I'd have to set something and set something and set something or that's okay, right? That, that's, that, that works here, but turns out there's a, a better way to do this. Um, and when we looked at, if I just make ticket here, I don't actually know if we looked at this. So if I run this in debug mode and I just say, hey, I want a ticket here. Once I have a ticket in Eric's ticket here, my values are garbage. Right? When it created this instance of ticket, you can't see the screen, can you? <laughs> I got to click this button over here. Thank you. You just got to holler at me. Just holler at me. How about now? Okay. Now we can see the screen up front. So when I look at Eric's ticket, my ticket number, my customer name, and my confirmation code, the two integer values here are garbage. Thankfully, the string is just empty. So this this is it's not the worst, you know, could be better, but this is an okay default. So when we create a class or create an instance of the class here, something sets these values here. So what we want to do is we want to give ourselves values. This is called initialization. When we initialize, when we create an instance of, and what happens is it runs a constructor. How does, this, how does this object get constructed? So the constructor here is a special function that the name matches the name of the class. 
Now, they go through this. Uh, remember how you can define a function, the prototype of the function, and then later on you can actually give it the real definition if you don't want to put everything in line. I hate doing that, so I, I will generally not. Other people love it. If other people love it, go for it. Make them happy. I don't like doing it because it's a lot more typing for me. But that's really why. Um, so if you want, you can have the essentially the prototype of your class here. And then you can go and define them all. And to do that, then it's restaurant colon colon function. Restaurant, like the class name colon colon function. It's just a bunch of ugly typing. So uh, again, a little bit weird. I, I prefer not to do that. So I will just put them all in line. So to add a constructor function, it just goes in our public sec, generally public. Uh, you can technically have private ones. We'll not worry about that for right now. So there's no return type for a constructor function. So constructors are, are fancy. Constructors are special. There's no return type. Okay, so it's just ticket. So this ticket constructor then takes no arguments and I can set some values here. I can say my ticket number is zero. My customer name is blank, and my confirmation code is zero. Right, so this constructor now is going to give these values here. So when Eric's ticket runs, if I step into, now I actually get this constructor code. Interestingly, like we don't have to call the constructor. You just by saying, hey, I want a ticket, it's doing it for us. So this is implicitly calling this default constructor, this no argument constructor. And I will set my ticket number, my customer name, my confirmation code. Now Eric's ticket has some values. They're default values, but they're not garbage. Right? Default is always better than garbage. Right? Garbage values are bad. They make everyone sad because they're garbage. So we want to give nice default values here. So let's adding a constructor, then it goes and sets the values, right? The constructor's job is to give values to all the attributes of the class. Yeah, that, that's worth writing down, right? Constructors' job is to give values to all attributes, right? You want no garbage. Always no garbage values, right? So great. So we haven't really gotten anything better now here, though, aside from we don't have garbage values to start. I still have to go set them all one at a time. So what would be cool is if I had a parametized constructor. It's another fancy word. It's a constructor with parameters. So I can say, hey, I want a ticket given an int for ticket number. Ticket number. I want a string for customer name. And I want an int for confirmation code. Right? So cool. So you can give me parameters for this constructor. And then I can basically just do my set stuff, right? I could go assign them or, you know, I already have set... Uh, Ticket number, right? Given the ticket number, why not use my my functions here? Set customer name, given the customer name. Uh, now remember, there is no set confirmation code because right? we didn't have that. We only had a assign random code here. So sure. So maybe we'll say here's the confirmation code. Right? Like this confirmation code equals the confirmation code. So now I'm going to have a constructor that. I can give some arguments to if I want. So if a Jeb's ticket is, and notice I get this cool little drop down here. So here's the first constructor with the parameters. Here's the constructor with no parameters. There's technically this and technically this. Don't, don't worry about those right now. We'll get to those later. So now we have a no argument constructor and we have a parametized constructor. So I can give it, hey, Jeb's ticket is ticket number one. That one's for Jeb. And his confirmation code is, Six five four three two one. Right. So when my construct my ticket runs, right, if I step into, I get the no argument constructor because that's the one I specified or by default I get. Right. When Jeb's ticket runs, we get the parametized constructor and we'll set ticket number, right, which checks the ticket number is not, not less than zero, and then we'll set the customer name. Sets the customer name and this sets the confirmation code. So this is makes it easier for me to give values to these tickets without having to go and call these set methods. All right, so that's kind of handy. And then the other piece here now is I have a way to set a confirmation code. Before, the only way I could get a confirmation code was by assigning a random one. 
which is fine for new tickets. But what if I wanted to read those tickets out of my file, right? My little Ticketmaster program. Once I read the confirmation number, I had no way to actually give it back to that ticket and assign it to that ticket. So this is kind of handy. It gives us a way to give a confirmation code here, right? And then maybe even we'd want another constructor. You can you can be silly with these if you want, or or we can have defaults. Um, we'll we'll try it this way. So we'll say, hey, I want a ticket given an int for ticket number, and that's the only argument I want here. So I'll set ticket number, given the ticket number, and then I'll set customer name equals blank and confirmation code equals zero. Right. So you can have multiple functions, multiple constructors with different lists of parameters. And we could do that with functions too. We never did a whole lot of that with it, but we could have two functions with the same name that took different parameters. I think we talked about that. If not, for sure it's iBooks. So different ways of making these tickets here just to make life a little easier for us. We got some options. So this is having lots of different constructors. Uh, this is known as overloading is our technical term. So we have lots of different versions here of ways that we can do that. And all of them, right, their job is to make sure we have no garbage values. That's the goal here. So, and again, we could use our sets in any of these. Uh, I like using the set methods. That's kind of fun. Oh, customer name should be lowercase c there. There we go. Oh, so I don't know if you saw that. So this was showing up in white here. So I knew it was not the gray argument here. So it happened... It wasn't actually going to work for us here, right? Because customer name was going to be blank. I think I forgot. I didn't actually check that, did I? So when I ran that, let's try it. When I had it wrong here, so for Jeb's ticket, it never set the name here. Right? I tried to set Jeb, but because my code was wrong, right? Because my constructor said, hey, I'm going to call this capital C customer name, and then I never use this variable. I use the lowercase c customer name, which is my attribute for customer name. It set it to itself. That was no good here. So now this one should work. So now Jeb's ticket, yeah, now belongs to Jeb. He's been assigned. Cool. So we found a bug. We fixed it. So we can use our constructors here to set those values, right? And then classes and vectors worth of classes. This is what we did in our lab exercise, right? We had a vector of item, right? To build that little shopping list or grocery list, right? So a vector of type something. Right? We can do that. We went and did that, and you just go get them all out like we did. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Separate files for classes. I like separate files for classes. You can put everything in an H file. H is for header. Uh, there's H and there's HPP files. H is the original C++ plus C headers. We still call them H files. You can be HPP if you want to be a C++ header file. It doesn't matter much um, as far as I care. Some people care a whole lot, which is fine. So generally, right, we looked at building out stuff in other files and having to do that if defined stuff we did functions, right? So we can do the same thing here. So I can go add a new item here. Now, different languages have different conventions for this sort of thing. So I started off with Java way back when, and Java says you should have one class per file. And I've liked that convention ever since. I still like it, even if you don't have to. So I'm going to say, hey, I want a header file here. And let's call this one ticket. So I'm going to make a header file for the name of the class that I'm writing here. You don't have to, but I, I like this idea. So you'll have the name of the file is the class that it stores. And life is pretty good here. So I'm going to take everything from ticket here. And I'm going to go cut it out here. I'm going to go put it over my ticket H file. And I need to, what is it, I'm using, no, include string. And using namespace standard. Okay. I think that one's happy here. Now it says, hey, I don't know what a ticket is. Right? Because ticket doesn't belong in this file. So we have to go do that include thing, right? So you can include your other files. So include, and then instead of the you know diamond operator, we just put in quotes. What file do you want to include? Hey, I want to include ticket.h. It was there. There it goes. And if when I include ticket h. It's essentially copy pasting the contents in when we build. That's what include mostly does. It is a little bit of interesting magic. You can go learn more about compilers in another class. Uh, for our purposes, imagine it does copy pastes in on top. Right? It's just a little shortcut. But 
Now we can do all the same stuff we did before using ticket and we leave ticket in its own file, which again, you feel like we haven't really gained a whole lot, but remember what source control tools do for us is they track changes file by file by file, line by line by line. So if I break out all my classes into separate files, I can see the last time they've been changed separate from, hey, I've got one giant file with 10,000 lines. This is the file that changes every single time. So by breaking my, my classes out into files, I can see when each class changes just in source control, which is pretty handy. So I think we looked at way back when was it, uh, Microsoft's VS Code library, their repository here. So if we looked at in their source code here, uh, they have all their, I don't know what's even in here, all these different files. You can see when these different pieces changed, right? How long ago they changed. Again, as you're looking through, trying to either change some functionality, figure out what went wrong somewhere, this file that hasn't changed in two years probably doesn't have the bug if something new just broke, right? The file that changed most recently, two weeks ago, this might have changed something that broke some features, right? As we're looking at how do we troubleshoot what's happening, it can help you narrow in on things and then focus on just when this file was changed, which is really fun. So just a convention. You don't have to do that. And then if you want, you can do just an H file and then just the CPP file that has the implementation of that H file, if you want to do it that way. Um, the one benefit, so as projects get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, having separate H files and CPP files will speed up the build time. So, so far when we build, it's super fast for us. So just building is a process. Ours is like that because it's very small. As you have thousands and thousands and thousands of files, if you just have your H files, it has to go and recompile them in your file here. If you separate them out, if the CPP implementation file hasn't changed, that comp compilation doesn't change at all. It gets skipped when we build. So it speeds things up a little bit. So some people are fond of that because they think every you know couple milliseconds counts. For our purposes, we could care less, right? We're not doing anything that big. When things get big, yes, yes, that's important. You know, if you've got a hundred developers in an organization working on a really big product here, and it adds a minute to everybody's build time, that's a big waste of time, right? So if you can if you can shorten a hundred people's, because we build like multiple, multiple, multiple times a day, right? When you were like testing out your programs, are you running it a lot? Like I run it a lot. Like I try something and I run it. I try something and I run it. Like it's probably like 50 times a day I'm running, right? So if you can take a minute out of 50 times, right, that's a big savings. That's all. So I, I pretend like it's not that important. It's not important for our purposes. It is important in the real world. So that's all. Um, so looking at uh, our different classes here, right? You can, you can go nuts. So here's restaurant. Here's review. Here's the reviews file. Sure. You know, go, go nuts, whatever you want to do here, right? And they kind of put all this together here. So a in single review, right? You can just kind of see what its, its details are. So it has a rating and it has a comment. Sure. A reviews is the vector of reviews, right? Here's your review list here. You can get some reviews. You can print comments. You can get the average review rating. And then a restaurant, right, has reviews. So this idea that classes can have other classes. Right, as an attribute. So an attribute of restaurant is all of its reviews combined. All of its reviews combined is a bunch of reviews in a vector. Right? So like we have the sort of chain of this class has this class, which has this class. And that's okay. Right? We can do that. If we want to be really basic, we talked about like student, right? Your, your name is probably just a string. That's pretty easy here. But the list of classes that you've taken that's probably like a vector of a class for class. <laughs> so, sorry, uh, pun unintended, right? And that class would have, hey, what what semester was it? You know, what was your grade in it? And any sort of details about that class, right? We go into that class thing, right? We have that vector of classes. And that, you know, we kind of put these classes together when we build our objects. We build our, our, our classes here. So lots of fun stuff can happen as we compose classes. This idea of how we decide what classes to build, right? A person class and a team class, right? Team could have a coach, could have another coach, and might have a list of players, right? They're all persons, right? So person can represent different things. A person can be a coach, a person can be a player. This is where we're using it. Sort of interesting. Um, team persons. That's a 
team person. That's a lovely, lovely name there for a class. Sure. All right. Unit testing. This is one of my favorite topics. Uh, I get excited about weird things. Uh, but the idea is, how do we know if our code does what it's supposed to do? Right? Because any code worth writing is worth testing to make sure it does what it's supposed to do. Right? You don't just write code and don't care if it works or not. Right? I think when you write code, you care if it works. So the only thing we've done so far to make sure that stuff works is when I run my program, I can take debug mode off here, sorry. I look at the output and I say, hey, did I get what I expect to get? Right? That's how we've tested our program so far. And if I type something in, I should get something back out. Right? This idea, if you know what goes in, you know what should come out. Now we're dealing with some random confirmation numbers here, so you know, obviously we'd get a little bit of random stuff, but we should see names and, and those sorts of things in this list of vectors, right? So we know based on what goes in, what should come out. Do you guys ever write English papers? Have you ever done that? Do you, do you know what went in and what was supposed to come out? Right? You know what you meant to write? Do you always get back out what you meant to write? I guess, yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you ever have like the word and in there twice or misspell words or, or like you mean something doesn't mean it comes out on the other end, right? So proofreading is important, right? Editing is important. So same idea with our code. You know what it's supposed to do. You told it to do that, but you didn't always do it right. Right? Is that fair? Happens all the time. So eyeballing the output here is it's kind of a similar idea. Even if you proofread your English paper, because you know what was supposed to happen, sometimes you still miss that stuff. Right? Getting someone else to proofread it for you who doesn't know what was supposed to happen and doesn't know what was in your head, they proofread so much better, right? So we want someone else to check to see, did our program give us what we expected? Right? Because they would be better at it than us. You know who's who's really good at saying, hey, I, I expect to get a 27 out when I put a 15 in? Because that's what my algorithm does. Computers. Computers are really good at that. You say, hey, if I give you a 15, I want 27 back. Right? They can check that every time. And they can do it really, really, really quick. So the computers can do this idea of unit testing. So the unit test is testing one small unit. Generally one function at a time. Now our ticket class is kind of boring here. But uh, it doesn't do a whole lot. But that's okay. So we can test this out here. So to write unit tests. I'm going to right click here and I'm going to say, oh, where did it go? Oh my goodness, there was a shortcut for me. No. Wow. Doesn't it go to? I'm losing it. I'm losing my mind here. Go to none of these. Oh, okay. No, I'm sorry. I, I have to do this. Um, other tools are better. Uh, this one's a little slow. So to make unit tests, you can do what, what I'll call the poor man's unit tests, and you can put in code that says, hey, I'm going to see out failed or not if I get some data. This is awful. Please don't do this. If you don't have Visual Studio, you're probably going to have to do this. I'm sorry. Um, doing this in Macland is awful. Um, Visual Studio is way better for doing this sort of thing. So their idea is, Hey, they're going to get the average of one number, right? And we want to make sure we actually calculated the average, right? Now, just looking at this real quick in Zybooks here, do you see their bug for calculating average? They forgot Aunt Sally, right? If you take number one plus number two divided by two, our order of operation says we're going to divide first. So they're going to have a bug, right? So their test for it says, okay, I'm going to set number one and set number two. And then when I get number one, do I get 100 back? That's my set. Test my set method. Test my set function. That one's kind of boring, but sure. Set number one and two and get the average. Is the average of 10 and 20, 15? Well, this one's going to fail because we screwed up. It found a bug. And that's the idea here. We're going to make the computer check these values here. Now, this sort of idea of this being the test bench is super ugly and awful, and I hate it. So the better way to do it here, we're going to go add a test project. This will be a little nuts here. It's okay. I'll practice it when we come back after Thanksgiving in lab because unit testing is fantastic. I just want to show it to you real quick here so you can see it once. So, so far we've done a solution is a bunch of one or more projects and we've only ever done one project. 
And we've had one project per solution. Now we're going to see that a solution can have more than one project, and it's super cool. So I'm going to go to my solution here, and I'm going to say I want to add a new project. And I'm just going to search in my template here for test. Come on. Shouldn't take this hard to search. There it goes. And we want the native unit test project. I think this Google test works on other... Uh, it doesn't say it works for, for Mac. Shoot. I don't know what you do in Mac land. I hate Xcode. I'm sorry. Uh, you can do the poor man's unit tests like this, and it's awful. And just feel bad, feel bad about yourself. Or you can try the lab computers. So that's what we're doing right now, unit testing. We're doing it in Visual Studio. What? I right-click solution and said add a new project. That's what I just did. Yeah. So we're going to add the native unit test project. I'll just call it unit test one. It doesn't really matter. If, you can call it whatever you want here. Uh, we'll say create. So it's going to add a new project. It adds a bunch of stuff here. We don't know what a bunch of this stuff does yet. That's okay. So we'll get there. So what I want to do is I want to test my ticket class. So I'm going to include. Now, right now, there's nothing here for me to include because there's no other files in here. But if I put dot dot, it goes up a level here. So dot dot is, it says go up a folder. And then I want my chapter eight classes folder and I want the ticket H file. So this is saying, hey, right, go copy paste this ticket file in here for you, essentially, right? The include will grab everything. So I can grab all the stuff here for ticket. And I'm going to make a bunch of these test methods. So test methods are what will run to test our code. So generally, we want to test all the code here, right? Because any code that's worth writing is worth testing. So let's just make a ticket here and get some values back out. So the first test here is we're going to say test method, I don't know, default constructor or no argument constructor, argument constructor. Now, this is going to feel a little tedious. I'll admit it's a little tedious. There's a lot of value in having tests later, right? This idea that software runs for a long time, right? It costs a lot of money to pay someone to write software. So companies want to use their software for a long time. And the longer you use software, the more likely it is you have to tweak it or modify it or change it or maintain it. Right. So most of software lives in this maintenance phase and having unit tests will save you in maintenance phase. Um, later on, that'll make more sense, but uh, for now it's okay. So what we're going to do here is we're going to follow this AAA format or convention. Uh, just a convention is not required at all, but it, it is a nice way to go about it here. A lot of people like this. We're going to arrange. This is going to set up the variables we need. Test. We're going to act is call the code. For testing and get values, and then we're going to assert. Uh, assert. Did we get what we expect? Okay, so we're doing that exact same thing here, right? This is arranging. Get number is what we're testing, right? Does this work here? And then here's the assert, like right? does it match? They kind of combined it all. So to arrange here, if we're testing our no-argument constructor, we're going to have an in for expected. Ticket number is zero, right? We expect to get ticket number zero on this no argument constructor. Uh, string for expected, oops, expected uh, customer name. Customer name is blank, just a blank string, right? And then for expected confirmation code, confirmation code is zero, okay? That's what we expect. Now we're going to act. The code that we're calling here is the ticket constructor, the no argument constructor. So ticket, okay, it's like lowercase t ticket. This calls the constructor, right? Technically, we could put in the parentheses if we want it here, I think. Yeah, I think we can put in the parentheses. It does the same thing for us, essentially, right? Then we need to go get the values, right? So we'll have an in for the actual ticket number is my ticket dot get ticket number. Oh, shoot. No, we can't use the parentheses. Ticket dot get ticket number. And then we'll have a string for the actual customer name. Is ticket dot get customer name. And then we'll have an int for the actual confirmation code. Is my ticket dot get confirmation code. Right? And then we'll assert. So this calls the code we're testing and then gets the values out. These are the values I care about. Now, do we get what we expected? So I can say assert, uh, which one is it? Assert. 
Oh goodness. Where is it here? It's a uh, cert equals. No, oh, this one, a cert dot. Cert. There we go. So a cert. Um, is it just equal? R equal. I think R equal is what I want. Cert R equal, my expected ticket number. Expected ticket number and the actual ticket number. So we're, this assert r equal is coming from the unit test library. So we're using all this cool unit test library stuff. We don't have to worry about that. It's really cool. So we'll compare for us. So we're going to check that three things are equal. Right? My expected customer name and the actual customer name. My expected confirmation code, my actual confirmation code. Right? So we're going to say, hey, are these three things equal? My ticket number and the actual ticket number, what I expected to get and what I actually got, what I expect to get and what I actually got. Right? And then when we run this code here, you can right click and run. Oh, let's not run it. Uh, if you go to test here, you go to the test explorer. This is why unit tests are super cool. You get this really fun test explorer. I want that doc. Hang on. I want that. I want it over here, right? There we go. I like it over here. That's, that's all right. So I'm going to say run. I want to run all the tests. Oh, build your solution and then run all. Okay, so build, build solution. Now it found some tests. So it will say, hey, here's some tests. That's why naming is nice here, but we just left it as unit test one. It's kind of boring. I can run my tests. I run all, run all tests. And then I'll see this test passed. You get a nice little green check mark. Very exciting. Now, if I said, hey, like I expected to get ticket number one here and I run my tests, It's going to fail. And if we look at the failure here, so the windows are a little weird here. It says, hey, you expected one, you actually got zero. So this is why this is so much nicer than this garbage here. You just said, you just see a failed see out message sort of thing here. That's, that's ugly. This gives you this nice little explorer to see specifically what test failed. You can go to run just that test again. Once we have unit tests, because the computer is doing this for us, we don't even have to look at any output. The other cool thing you can get is, if I post it here, GitHub soft, you can get this idea of continuous integration testing. So we can look at, oh, no worries, I want the list of commits here. See, there's this little orange dot here. The tests are still running. When I get a green check mark here, it means all the tests passed. So all these different tests that are set up here. And there's different levels of testing. That unit testing is the smallest level. You can do system testing or integration testing or end-to-end -end testing. Lots of fun stuff here. You can have your source control tool, like GitHub, automatically run tests because the computer can run them. It doesn't rely on a human to run the test and look in the output and say, oh, I put in 15, I got 27 out. If, the, if you can write code to make the computer test it, the computer can run it. So what it does is anytime the code changes in the repository, all of the tests are run, right? It's still running the tests right now. So these tests passed here, these ones are still running. So we can offload that checking or the testing work onto the computer and we can get this continuous integration testing. So as code is integrated into the source control tool, it gets tested. So obviously when you're working on part of it, you'll test your little piece here. But if it takes like 15 minutes to run all these tests, you don't want to sit and wait for 15 minutes and lock your laptop up for 15 minutes and not be able to do anything, right? You want to save yourself some time, make your developers more productive, so you make the computer do it. So I can check in my code, commit it to GitHub, and then it will run the tests for me. There's some cool stuff you can set up to make it do that. We're not quite there yet. Um, generally, I would do that in lab in the next class, uh, but we're not there yet, so that's okay. Um, we're using GitHub. We can make it run tests for us, which is super fun. And then we can get our own little, hey, we get our green check marks or orange orange dots or some of these will fail. Yeah, like the, so this one failed, right? This test failed. And we can go to the details here. Uh, it looks like, yeah, this is probably just uh, not the most helpful error here. So I don't think any of their code failed. This is probably related to something else. I don't know what it was, but you can see if the tests fail, bad stuff happened. Oh, here's what failed here. Access token. Yeah, okay. So let's... I don't know exactly what was going wrong here, but their their test was fine. Uh, is it the same issue? Yeah, I think they're having some issues with Azure. But. 
something else unrelated, but you can see what's happening with your tests here. Now, this one was really boring here, but a more interesting test, right, is actually the, the code that we wrote for like set ticket number. Right, so I'm gonna un I'm just gonna leave that over there. The, the pin here will leave it, right? It pins it to the side. If you unpin it, it lets it collapse here. Uh, that's all with that one. So I'm gonna test the set ticket number. So I don't care about the customer name or confirmation code, right? I only care about the, the expected ticket number here. I need a ticket here, right? Oh uh, shoot, I want the actual ticket number. There we go. I need the actual ticket number and I'm gonna assert those ones are true. Okay. So when I make a ticket here, I'm gonna try and change the ticket number. So I'll say ticket dot set ticket number. And if we set ticket number, let's say it was maybe 42, I'm gonna set it to the expected ticket number. And then I'll get the ticket number back out. So technically you can move ticket up here to arrange instead of act, because we're we're not testing the constructor, we're testing the set ticket number. It's probably right. It I don't really care one way or the other here. Um, but this sets up the variables we need to test. I need a ticket to test with, and I need the expected values. Then I'm going to call. What code are we testing? We're testing set ticket number, and it'll get its value back out. So we can run this test. So let's go to Test Explorer. Oh, we got to build first, sorry. So build. And then we can run our tests. Did I fix that one back? Oh, I forgot to put that one back. This is the expected ticket number, right? I want that test to pass again. Okay. We should be able to run our tests. Also, set ticket number failed. It expected a one, right? It actually was a 42, right? Because I left the one in here for my copy paste, right? I want the expected ticket number. So let's try that again. So let's run our test. So we could just run just that one too. It's fun. All right, now it passes. So if we look at our code for ticket here, the test sick test of set ticket number, we know this line of code ran. So there's there's this idea of a we call it code coverage. How much of our code is running? when our class is being tested. So if my test for set ticket number, if we don't give it this a value to make this true, this line of code 48 will never run. We don't have 100% code coverage. And like fancy tools, and if you pay for Visual Studio licenses, it will measure that for you automatically. We're just using the free version because it's free and cheap and easy. So we're just going to eyeball this. And our code is not that complex. We don't need these tools to measure it for us. We can look and say, hey, I have an if, I have an else. I need a test that runs the else. I need a test that runs the if right, to get 100% code coverage. So I've tested set ticket number, but I haven't tested all of it. So one test for set ticket number is fine. I need another one here. So I'm going to copy paste this one. This is te test set ticket number negative. Right. So we should expect to get a zero if we set it to, I don't know, like negative 10. Right. Because our code says, if you give me negative, just leave it at zero, right? So this test, we should be able to run this one here. Let's uh, build a solution, run our tests. Now this one hopefully will pass, right? Because we did our code right. Test, test set ticket number, it worked. Right? We expected to get zero, we actually got zero. So now when we look at our ticket class, we know or we can eyeball and say, hey, I've got 100% code coverage. This line is gonna run and this line will run. Two different tests, that's fine. Right? With these unit tests, we're going to break out one small unit at a time. So we're testing each individual piece, each individual function here. Now, generally don't spend a lot of time doing the git tests because we use the gits here when we tested our constructor. Right? I don't have a test like they did in Zybooks. We don't have a test for git number specifically right? because we did that with our constructor. Now, I guess they're testing the set and the get at the same time, right? Our code happened to use the sets, right? So you, you can get as detailed as you want. I find that a little bit obnoxious to have a separate test for set and get. Right? I'm not going to bother. I'll just do them in the constructor usually. If I have something interesting like set ticket number that has some interesting code in there, I'll test that, right? And then we also know our constructor, if we use this one here, uses the sets already. So I could test this constructor, right? So maybe we would do one more here. So we're going to do our constructor... This is the constructor with parameters. 
So you probably want to give it values that are not defaults, right? Just, just to be careful here, like if you pass it the value that should be the default value, you don't actually know if it's getting set correctly. So just, just be a little careful there. So now when I call ticket with my expected ticket number, expected ticket number, my customer name, and my confirmation code, right? I should be able to get those same values back out, right? If I give it 42, Eric, and one, two, three, four, five, six, that's what I should get back out, right? And now the beauty of copy paste, I don't have to eyeball anything on the screen at all, right? Now that I did the hard one the first time, all of this is here ready for me, right? I just had to copy paste, change a couple values. So now it's actually going to be faster for me to test different things, right? And now my constructor with parameters passes. It worked for me, right? We probably could test this one with just the ticket number. I don't, I'm not too concerned. I think I'll actually just get rid of that one here. That one's not, or I'll just comment that out. It's not very exciting. Uh, that's control E and then C in your edit advanced. You can comment a whole section, toggle line comment. Uh, I think E and C. I don't know. Yeah, comment selection E and then C. That was that one to undo E and then U. There's shortcuts for everything. Sorry. Sometimes I use it without thinking. Uh, so testing this random value here is going to be really hard to do, right? We could test that the numbers between 100,000 and 9999999, and maybe that's fine, like to make sure we got within the range we wanted. But I'm not going to know specifically what the value is, right? Because it's using that random sequence, unless we go and seed random, which we could do, right? We could seed our random number generator. Right? That's a lot of work, but we could try it. Uh, I, I don't think we need to spend the time on it right now. So that's the idea of testing our code, right? Testing our classes. Um, yeah, constructor overloading. We did that constructor initializer list here. Let's see what's this one. Um, it's a, a little shortcut for if you're setting values here, you can use the initializer syntax here. If you're just saying, here's the value, here's the value. It's, it's just a shorthand way of initializing them. That's all. Um, that's kind of cute. Like, here's my item list is two uh, sort of thing. That one's fun. The this we did, right? We looked at setting our this. So if we're doing this shadowing here, right, we need to say this is my class level attribute. This is the parameter. Uh, did that one. Operator overloading is fun. I don't think we're going to get into that right now. Uh, I think we get into that next semester more. But if you want, you can say, hey, I can define how the plus works. So a student plus another student doesn't really make a lot of sense, but like a time class plus another time class. We should be able to add two times together. Sure. Right. So if it makes sense, you can define your operator function here. Those get a little, little crazy here. Um, yeah, that's fine. It's static you'll get into later. Awesome. So we did pretty good. All right. Should we talk about the final project? All right. Do you folks like games? I hope you like games, right? You like games? Did you ever play that game as a kid? Um, I'm probably not allowed to use the proper name of it, right? Uh, but it was the idea, this game as a kid, you'd go around and to, you'd have fun trying to bankrupt your friends, and make them run out of money and cry, and take all their things. You remember that game? It's Monopoly. Yeah, like, but why not teach your kids go around and take your friends' money until they have to give you start giving you their property to pay off their debts, and then they just lose the game. That's not weird at all. No, I, I love the game. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, 2023. It just seems a little odd here. So our final project, um, we're going to build a Monopoly style game, a, a simpler version of Monopoly style game, but something similar to that because games are fun. Okay. And this will be our C++ repo template. There we go. All right. This, uh, GitHub Classroom thing is really cool, too. If I, I could write unit tests to run on your code, that, was that, that test window I just skipped past, so I could define it to say, hey, run these unit tests when they turn in their code, and it can actually simulate C in and C out. So when you would use a C in, it would give you pre-canned data. And then when you'd C out, I would steal the C out and run a unit test against it to compare, did it get what I got? Did it get what I expected? It's kind of fun. So there, there's this idea of like auto grading. So you give it some input, some output shows up, you can build those sort of tools. They're a lot of fun. Anyway, so assignments. So our final project. 
Uh, I think, I, yeah, I made a category for it. Look at that, final project. I put it out here. All right, so we're going to have some rather specific requirements for the final project here, okay? Because we need to build this thing iteratively, right? And my best effort in making sure you don't go out to chatbot, which can't even solve everything anyway, and just turn in one thing, um, is going to have these requirements, okay? So we're going to submit URL to your repository, or include screenshots of it running in the readme. So you must have at least 10 commits of working software, working code, over 10 separate days. So between now and the end of the semester, 10 different days with at least one commit. So the idea is you're working on this incrementally. You don't have to build it all to start. Let's build something that runs, and then we'll keep on adding to it. We'll build something that runs and keep on adding to it. Build something that runs and keep on adding to it. So we're going to build these little features in as we go, as, as we write it here. Um, Honestly, it's my best attempt to make people not cheat, and then also it's good for you. you. You want to have to be working on this early, and you want to work on it in little chunks. Some people think, hey, I'll just wait until the last day, and then I'll work for 18 hours straight. Um, there's actually been scientific studies done that show developer productivity goes down after a certain number of hours because your brain just turns into mush. And because development and writing software is a creative process, when you get tired and frustrated and angry, you are less creative and less able to write working software. So uh, they've actually shown making teams work mandatory overtime can decrease the quality of the product because it introduces more bugs into the code. So even if they do get it sort of working and something running is likely to have bugs. So really cool scientific studies out there that show overwork is bad, right? And, and that's a great thing, you know, obviously not everyone listens. And sometimes you get awful places like game studios that make people work these crazy seven, you know, seven days a week to get the product out the door for a launch date that someone arbitrarily set in management. And instead of saying we should push back the delay and have a better product, like Nintendo does, they're like, no, we said we're going to ship at this date. We're going to ship at this date no matter what. So screw you. And whole other stories there. Uh, but so um, without the 10 commits over 10 days, you will not get a score. So absolutely hard stop here. No score. You know uh, what grade you get in the class if you don't pass the final project? Yeah, you don't pass the class. So, gotta have 10 days, 10 commits here. Um, it should work. I'm not gonna be like, I'm not gonna test every single commit and make sure it will build and compile and run here. But the idea is you build a little bit and get that working. You build a little bit and get that working. You build a little bit and get that working, right? Not, hey, I asked Chatbot for the solution. I'm just pasting in 10 different chunks of it, right? You, you can't just copy paste in 10 different chunks because you're not gonna have working software, that sort of thing. Right. So, and this is how software works in the real world. We build iteratively. You build a little bit at a time and you create adding features and adding features and adding features. Okay. Anyway, so we're going to write a basic version of Monopoly. Um, not trademarked or whatever. Like, we're not going to sell this. It, it's probably okay here. Um, I wouldn't go and advertise it but to your friends and family that you built Monopoly, though, because it's, it's not even Monopoly. Okay. So we're going to have have a... Now, we don't need to worry about chance cards or community chest cards because those are complex. Right? We're, we're going to try and keep things basic here. So we're just going to have property around the board. right? So if you take out the chance and community chest cards, there's less spaces on the board. So we'll just have blanks. right? So we're going to have the 10 by 10 board, right? which is really 40 spaces, if you think about it, right? Really, 40 spaces. Right, this idea of this is what the space is, right? Um, and then, I'm sorry. No, no, it's a square. Yeah, yep. So forty spaces. Um, we'll use have blanks instead of chance and community chest. Okay. So when the program starts, uh, we're going to ask. Um, so when the program starts, ask the player if they want a new game or to load a game. So we're going to be able to use files here to save game, right? We'll save, here's the state of the game, 
here's all the properties here who owns them here's the players here's how much money they have here's what space they're on here's whose turn it is right there's not too many details that go into it actually right because the properties are fixed we know the properties we just need to know who owns them right we need to know whose turn it is and where the players are on the board not a whole lot of, of information here right but we need to know what we're saving and how we're going to put it in the file so we can go and read it out later to load the game right well we can come back that can be a feature you do later right the, the save and load can be something you tackle later we're going to get the game working first this probably makes a whole lot more sense right right so we do save and load later right so for a new game ask how many players two to i don't know what eight players or something i think it's eight are there eight tokens pretty sure it's eight two day players right right so then each player starts with two hundred dollars right and on the start space or go space start okay so we probably want to have the list of properties right and it is again as we're trying to design this solution here design what this looks like people are going to do it in different ways and that's okay um I, I will require you to use at least one class, though, because like we're learning about classes. Not everything has to be a class, but I'm going to imagine classes are actually really easy for this. Like a player could be a class, right? It can have the space they're on as an attribute. It can have the amount of money that they have as an attribute, right? Maybe it can have the list of properties. Maybe the properties know who owns them, right? That, that sort of could go one way or the other, right? Our board is really just a list of properties so maybe property is a class right property could know who who owns it and how much rent is right for the spaces rent is just zero right that works out pretty well right the, the jail space there's no rent right uh the go to jail space is a little bit tricky there's no rent that's a that's a special handle case we have to deal with i would add that one in last or later right add in the jail stuff later right just figure out how we go around the board first the jail piece we can work out later Right, they, they, you know, go to jail space. I don't know. I'm trying to think of like a list of things to get in later. Go to jail space. Go to jail. The rolling doubles, three times. They, these sorts of things here. Um, you know, even uh, roll again after doubles. Like honestly, these things here, like, feel free to skip. Skip those, right? Your go to jail space we should have, but um, okay to see. I can't. Yeah, yeah. If you roll doubles three three times in a row, you're supposed to go to jail. Just skip that. Like, don't even add it to this because this is a basic version here, right? We're, we're not going to do everything, and that's okay. We just want to get some basics down. So I think the go to jail space is doable. This is pretty easy. Like, hey, if you land on space number this, move your character over to here to jail. Right. For jail, like they could pay fifty bucks to get out, or just make them pay fifty dollars to get out. Like you don't have to worry about waiting them to make make them roll doubles or anything, right? Make them pay to get out, right? Don't worry about the rolling doubles to get out, right? That that's more complex than we need here, right? And that's always something we could add in later if we care about, right? We're going for basic version of Monopoly, right? This is basic here, Monopoly basic, okay? So this idea of classes we could have, right? So classes we should use probably, like player, right? Has amount of money and what space they are on, right? We probably have a class for property or space, right? Three property, name, rent, rent amount, owner, right? So owner is probably pretty easy, like player number could be owner, right? Player number is easy for this, right? We probably have like a vector of players. You probably have a vector of property, right? The owner number could be their vector index. That's really easy, right? Right. Player maybe has name. You could add name. You could add number. Any, any way you want to do it, right? If you want to use names, use names. If you want to use numbers, use numbers. Name slash number. Again, whatever it is going to work for you. This this is going to look very different for everybody who does it, and that's okay, right? It's not. It will look exactly like this. You can implement it however you want. These sort of details here, but we should have player. We should have property. 
right? And really, that's the only information we need for saving and loading is what players, how much money, what properties, who owns them. The only last thing we need is whose turn is it, right? Saving and loading is not that hard, I promise. It won't be too bad, right? So that, that's okay, um, right? Um, so let's see, there's our due date. Um, we, we need to build a rubric out for this, right? For all of our points. So lots of different pieces are going into this here, right? So let's see if we can't, let me save this here. And let's build this out here. So for rubrics, let's do this, this is for the final project. And we'll have this is for grading here. So we'll have a player class. You get points just for having the player class. You'll have the property class. You get points for the property class. Right? So points just for having the classes here, even if it doesn't work. So you can still get something right? just for, for trying here. Right, and then we're going to have um, the save and load feature. So save and load, it, I say it's not that complex, but it's a decent chunk here. So we'll put that at 10 points. That seem okay? We're getting saving and loading to work. Um, and then we'll get the gameplay uh, players turn by turn. Go around the board. And spend money. Uh, probably 10 points for that. Oh, property needs to more information about property. Yeah, I'm forgetting here. Uh, property needs to know uh, the purchase amount. Right? How much it costs to purchase the property? So you can purchase it if it's not been bought, right? Did I lose my rubric? Oh, no. I lost my rubric. I did the wrong thing here. Come on, Canvas. Sorry, final project. Not groups, not groups. Okay, uh, so this was the player class, property class, property class, property class, the uh, save and load. I said that was 10, right? And we had gameplay. I'm sorry? I didn't hear you again. Yeah, so you need to have the class, though, to have a vector of them. Right, so you'll have a player class. The game will have a vector of those players. Right, The game will have a vector of those properties. Here it's going around the board. Spending money. Uh, players with zero or less are out runs until one player remains with money. Right. 10 points for that. And then what else are our points here? That, that's kind of a big feature, right? Let's see. Should we, should we break that up into more? Right. Prop like properties have owners, non-owners, let's pay rent to owner. It isn't it isn't owned, the player can purchase it by landing on it. Does that make sense? Like what, what the property does here? So if property is a class, right, we could have a method or a function for like get owner. And if we get maybe, or get owner number, get owner name, however you want to do that, name might be easy if the name is blank, and then you can go purchase it. Name gets a little weird because um, growing up as Eric, I was always in a class with other Eric's. So then you'd have to have like full names. And then if we're dealing with like get lines, we hate that because that's harder than CNs, those sort of things. Um, so maybe player numbers easier, like player number zero would be at index zero. Player number one would be at index one. It would just work pretty easily. You got some options here uh, for that. Let's see. So player class, property class. Um, we need five more points. What else? The uh, go to jail. Is that worth five points? Go to jail, space, net making, there's pay. 50 to get out of jail. Should we make that five points? What else do we need here? Is that pretty close? What do you think? Is that 40 points worth for Monopoly? So it seems like it's a lot, I promise. When we break it down and build it into small pieces here, like if we can tackle this in small chunks, right? Players rolling dice, hey, roll your 2d6 dice. 
2d6, by the way, is not the same as a random number between 2 and 12. Please don't do that. I'll be very sad. Your stats prof will be very sad. Right? Because you're much more likely to get a 7 when you roll two six-sided dice. Right? You get a nice little bell curve. We've taken stats, right? You haven't taken stats yet? Oh, I'm so sad. Uh, what is this? Uh, distribution. 2d6. This one here. This is probably right. There we go. 36 different ways you can get, or well, the dice can land, right? Six sides on the first die times six sides on the second die, right? 16.66% chance of getting a seven here, right? That's your most likely total here, right? Much smaller chance, much smaller chance. Okay, anyway, uh, that's what that is here. So just do the random numbers right. Um, you'll be okay. Thoughts, questions, concerns? I think I mentioned way back when you can work with partners on this if you'd like. You're not required to. So if you do want to work with a partner, I need your GitHub usernames to give your partner access to your repository. Let me put that in here. Uh, so if working with a partner, Eric, your GitHub usernames, set up shared access. Um, when you share access, make sure you do the, the fetch option first in GitHub, so the GitHub desktop client. I'm going to make sure we look for changes first. It's usually pretty good at it, and they'll say, hey, you have to go pull stuff. Like right now, it's telling me I have to go pull the lab down. Sometimes it forgets, so just make sure you fetch first. So here's chapter 8. More classes. And test. All right. So if you want to get started on an overbreak, great. If you want to wait till we get back, that's fine. There's still time. Have a week off. That's okay. Ideally, we can get it done before finals week, so you have nothing to worry about for finals week. During presentations, you'll just get up and play your game. Load a game, we'll finish it, we'll play a game, or we'll start a game, save the game, come back to it. Just show us the different stuff works here, right? Uh, so we've got pointers when we come back, and final project work time. That's all we got. All right, folks. Thanks. I will... How do you save the file? What? How do you save the file? Save. So, with a file. And you write all the data, data, write all everything information to a file, and then to load the game, you read the file and you repopulate your lists with that information. So instead of a, you know, all my properties start empty with no owners, I'll know who owns the properties. My players will start with a certain amount of money, and I'll know whose players' turn it is, and I know what space that they're on.